Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the afternoon session of BQE 2053. We have a little um, bit of dessert for you after your lunch. Um, hopefully it won't upset your stomach too much, but we are going to screen Adam Paul Sessonick's uh, video of the BQE. That is a lot of urban fabric that was just ripped up. So we're sorry if that was bad for digestion, but it is the reality. And hopefully in this afternoon session, we'll get some ideas about how maybe to put some of that fabric back. So to start us off, I, it is my pleasure to introduce Hank Gutman. He's the former New York City DOT commissioner and uh, one of the great experts on the BQE expert panel. Hank Gutman is quite familiar with the issues surrounding the BQE, having served it as NYC DOT commissioner in 2021, and prior to that, as a member of the mayor's expert panel on the BQE from 2019 to 2020. He currently serves as the chair of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, a position that he's held since 2014, and he's also a member of the board of the Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation. He and his family have lived within blocks of the triple cantilever since 1975, so Hank, be careful when you walk underneath any portion of that. <clears throat> yeah. Mr. Gutman is a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers, and he's currently a distinguished adjunct professor of law New York Law School. He also has an active uh, arbitration practice, and Mr. Gutman is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard Law School, which his parents are very happy about. And let me bring Hank up to start us off in the second half. So, and, and here I thought I was gonna be the person who disturbed people's digestion after lunch. Um, thank you, Jonathan, for the kind introduction. Thank you, Janet, uh, to friends and colleagues here. Uh, it's a real treat to be here, and uh, I have to say that I thought I knew a lot about the BQE, but I've learned a lot uh, in the session so far today. So thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity. Now, I want to talk about three things today. Uh, 
vision, time, and transparency, and explain why I think the DOT has been falling short in each category, sadly. And I say this with regret. I have great fond memories of my time working with some distinguished colleagues there. But when it comes to the BQE, I think, I think they're letting, letting us all down. So first, vision. At a time when our transportation policy is focused on reducing our dependence on private cars to move, move people and on oversized trucks to move goods, why is the New York City DOT so blindly committed to rebuilding Robert Moses' interstate truck highway through increasingly residential neighborhoods of Brooklyn and Queens, bigger than before, and strong enough to last another century. Seriously, ask yourself the question. And then ask yourself why they aren't asking themselves that question. All over our city, every day, we are shrinking streets, creating bike lanes, open streets, open restaurants, bus lanes, busways, expanded crosswalks, loading zones, and broader pedestrian spaces. It's good for the environment. It helps fight climate change. It enhances safety, and it is essential to the quality of life in our city. Induced demand is not some wild-eyed theory. It is an accepted fact of transportation and traffic policy. So why is this one highway, and perhaps the Cross Bronx, they haven't said enough yet, the only exception? We shrink our streets, but insist upon expanding this highway. Are we really this committed to providing interstate trucks with a way to avoid the tolls on the New Jersey Turnpike and those commuting in private cars to get to the toll-free Brooklyn Bridge bypassing the Battery Tunnel? And if you think I'm kidding about that, last time I saw statistics, it was something like 40% of the trucks were interstate and 25 to 30% of the cars heading from south to north on the cantilever each day have driven past the battery tunnel to avoid a toll. Let's talk about freight. It is embarrassing that New York City is substantially more dependent on trucks for freight delivery than any of our peer cities in the US, not to mention other great cities around the world. It is even more embarrassing that New York is notorious for our failure to enforce any of our legal restrictions on truck size or weight or on the truck routes defining which of our streets they can legally travel. The dramatic increase in freight volumes due to e-commerce and then the pandemic have only exacerbated the problem. Yes, we like to get our packages delivered and no, Jimmy Hoffa, we don't want our grocery shelves to be bare or our restaurants to run out of food. But this is not an excuse for doubling down on the status quo. It's an urgent call for a dramatic change in how we deliver goods in New York City. We cannot continue as we have. We have no choice but to reduce our dependence on oversized trucks. Now the good news is the city is working on creating freight alternatives. When I was commissioner, we outlined a series of initiatives. We published a plan from intermodal distribution centers to increased use of rail and our marine highway, overnight deliveries, cargo bikes, on and on. DOT is continuing that today. It's a priority for the new mayor as well. He has already announced the, a, new, a new cargo bike this week. Um, all of this is meant to reduce our reliance on oversized trucks for the last mile. Our harbors and rivers are an easy example of a, of a missed opportunity. They were our original highways. They are why New York is where it is and not someplace upstate. But today, the only freight we reliably ship on our waterways, garbage and treated sewage. It's ridiculous. We have a citywide commuter ferry system for the first time in 100 years. Wonderful innovation. Those boats go to bed at 10 o'clock at night. They could be used overnight to deliver packages. There are many, many more uh, examples of missed opportunities. Now, this isn't some wild fantasy. There's federal infrastructure money available for everything I've just listed, and perhaps as important or more important, the private businesses whose livelihoods depend on this, UPS, uh, uh, Amazon, FedEx, are already moving in this direction without waiting for the city of New York. This isn't some crazy notion. 
It's the world we need to move to, and everybody else is moving in that direction. So why is the New York City DOT betting that all these efforts will fail, that nothing will change in the decades ahead? And if they're really so convinced that we'll still need a truck highway uh, in 2053 or whatever, let me suggest the Belt Parkway. If you lifted those half dozen racist low bridges that Robert Moses put in, there's nothing wrong with using that for trucks. And by the way, it's a direct route to Kennedy, which is an important, probably the most important freight hub in the area. Now, the other vision deficit is in geography. Uh, we've heard from many people more eloquently than I could do it today talk about how, how sinful it is, how shameful it is that we ignore the North, BQE North and BQE South, that all this attention is spent on the middle. I mean, how, how can we possibly justify in the name of equity uh, spending billions of dollars on the cantilever in the one neighborhood which, as others have noted, was not divided by Robert Moses' highway because the community prevailed on him to go around it? How do you spend all of that money and not attend to the North and South? It's, it's, it's insane. And, and, you know, even if you can't solve all the problems, look at the ditches. We heard from speakers earlier today that there are terrific solutions that have been kicking around for years. Why aren't they on the agenda? Why instead are we just hearing about little beautification projects, things the DOT should be doing anyway? It was supposed to be 10 minutes, I thought. Okay. Things that I thought the DOT, I mean, sorry, I don't mean to ignore the prompt, but come on, give me a break. Uh, uh, you know, how, how, can, how can we ignore that when the plans are there? Why are they just saying, oh, we'll clean up under the highway and we'll put in some pedestrian access uh, and we'll build a park under the highway like anybody's actually going to want to go there? Give me a break. That is, the, that is the DOT equivalent of thoughts and prayers. When there are real plans out there, and yes, yes, I understand that the other portions of the highway are under the control of the New York City, uh, are not under the control of the New York City DOT, but the state. Big deal. Welcome to New York City. Are you new in town? There is almost nothing in the transportation space that doesn't require the cooperation of multiple different city agent agencies, city, state, or otherwise, and multiple government authorities. That's the way it works in this town. And that doesn't mean you can't do it. That's not an excuse for throwing up your hands and saying, oh, gee, not my job. It is a challenge, to be sure, and it requires more time. It requires more time. Which brings me to the second deficit, time. Even if there were a consensus plan for how to proceed today, and we aren't even close, there is no way the DOT could get that plan approved, designed, budgeted, and built before the cantilever section of the highway becomes unsafe for its current use. Here's why. In 2018, the DOT announced that unless the highway was rebuilt, by 2026, trucks, trucks would have to be thrown off and soon thereafter other cars. Our expert panel concluded that the 2026 number was an unduly optimistic estimate and that the real danger would come sooner. We're now halfway through 2023, and there is no plan. They, ain't, they aren't even close. Now, safety is a function of two things, the structural integrity of the highway and the weight it carries. Both are issues for the triple cantilever. And I'm focusing on the triple cantilever, forgive me, because this is the only place the DOT is actually focusing their attention and planning to spend money. It was built to hold trucks weighing the, the then legal limit of 72,000 pounds. The limit's now 80,000, and we measured trucks as heavy as 180,000 pounds. Roughly a quarter of the trucks, last time I had access to the data, were overweight, some by as much as 100,000 pounds. Now, we got legislation passed in 2021, thanks to Joanne Simon, who's here, that would give us the authority to automatically ticket those trucks. For technical reasons, they still haven't managed to implement the system, but those trucks are still there. We came up with other methods for policing those trucks, other legal methods. None of them have been followed. Uh, we did do one thing to reduce the weight. 
we, nar we reduced the three illegally narrow lanes to two legitimate width lanes and a, and a shoulder, including exit and entrance ramps. This had a dramatic impact. A, it does reduce the weight on the road, so we have bought some time. No, I'm not sure anybody can tell you how much, but we've done something. But it also dramatically improved the safety on the roadway instantly. Dramatic decrease in crashes because we had made it a safe roadway. Uh, as many of you know, there's a big debate now. Do we go back to three lanes? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, no. You don't have to. Why, would, why on earth would you expand the highway again? And by the way, if they do what I think they want to do, which is to tear it down and rebuild it rather than rehabilitate it, you then become subject to federal regulations which require it to be wider than it currently is, even at two lanes, and dramatically wider at three lanes. Why is this a debate? I mean, this is just silliness, especially when you factor in that in order to fit under the Brooklyn Bridge, it can't be any wider than it is now. So the bottleneck is there unless you're going to rebuild the Brooklyn Bridge too. I hate to suggest it, but you know. Um, so we've made some progress toward weight reduction, but then you've got structural integrity. The reason the, the cantilever is in a bad state of repair is because for 70 years, every time it snowed, they put salt on it. It's made of concrete and rebar. And if there's anybody in America who doesn't understand what happens when salt and water mix with concrete and rebar, ask the survivors of that poor uh, apartment building collapse in Florida. I was horrified to discover when I became commissioner, they were still doing it, years after having told the world that this was what was causing the collapse. So we stopped that. They're still doing it on other bridges, but that's a talk for another day. Um, but the problem is that that same salt is still sitting in the roadway. It's in the concrete. So even though we aren't putting new salt on, every time it rains, new water mixes with old salt and increases the deterioration of the roadway. Now, we did come up with an answer to this. This is why we proposed waterproofing the roadway. It was a relatively inexpensive step compared to what they're talking about now, the billions of dollars. Um, and it would have stopped further deterioration. And the experts, the engineers, said that if you did that, plus reducing the weight, which we did, the combination would buy you at least another 20 years of safe use. Now, critics have, have attacked that as kicking the can down the road. Pretty silly. Uh, I think a more accurate view of it was that we were building a temporary highway to the future that would buy us sufficient time to come up with and implement a corridor-wide solution and to get the state on board while keeping this highway safe for its current use in the meantime and also give us time to implement all of these freight alternatives that we're hard at work on. Um, now, the plan has since been scrapped, but the clock keeps ticking. I could go on about other things, sections of the highway that were identified as requiring urgent repair in 2018 that we had scheduled for 2022, that were then rescheduled for this spring that are still not done. Um, the one bit of good news is we did install some high-tech sensors in the highway. I'm not an engineer. My understanding is that if the road starts moving in funky ways, if it's supposed to vibrate like this and it starts going like this, these sensors will set off an alarm. It's like the fire alarm in your house. It isn't going to prevent a fire, but it at least gives you a warning so maybe you can save some lives. So when the DOT talks about this is the most carefully monitored, censored, inspected highway, blah, 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 this is what they're talking about. It's not nothing, but it doesn't extend the life of the roadway. Uh, so, do I expect an earthquake or something like that? You know, I'm not, I'm not in that line of work. Um, could we have a repetition of the West Side Highway? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the final issue, and, and again, this is one where I have real regret, is the lack of transparency. And I think it's time, I mean, to their credit, the DOT is doing public outreach we had advocated that in the last administration. The expert panel said you need to go corridor-wide and get input for the entire corridor from all the affected communities, not just the loudest. And the DOT has been doing that outreach. 
Um, it might be better if they focused on structural changes to the north and the south rather than asking people whether they minded traffic and liked their packages delivered on time, but at least they're making some effort. But it's time for the process to get real and honest and transparent, and I'm gonna focus for the last few minutes on the triple cantilever. I mean, as we all know, it began life as an architectural and urban planning miracle, right? I mean, people heralded this design, and it was a successful effort to prevent Robert Moses from dividing a neighborhood. So when the DOT says, oh, we're gonna reunite the neighborhood by doing whatever we're planning to do on the cantilever, forget it. That neighborhood was never divided. You're not reuniting a neighborhood. That's garbage. Um, uh, but that cantilever design ends up being a problem in terms of your options for repairing the bridge because you can't do it lane by lane the way you could on a regular bridge. And the cantilever is less stable inherently than a, than a normal bridge would be. Um, but what the DOT seems to be overlooking so far in its work on the cantilever is that in the years since that highway was built, there's been a second spectacular masterpiece of public work. It's called Brooklyn Bridge Park. It took over 25 years and over $450 million, not counting the 100 plus million dollars that were, that were necessary in order to repair the pilings to keep it from falling into the East River. It is, it converted 85 acres of abandoned commercial waterfront into a world-class park that is currently enjoyed by over five million people a year from all over the city and beyond. It would be hard to find a better place in which to experience the full diversity and boundless energy of this amazing city. It is a treasure. And I don't just say that because it's been my principal civic engagement for those last 25 years. I think any objective person would agree. But that's the problem. The distance between the decaying highway and the spectacular park is still just the two lanes of Furman Street, one of which is mostly covered by the current highway. That hasn't changed since the plan announced by my predecessor, Polly Trottenberg, and I will pause to say what I always say when I talk about that plan. She, she and the mayor deserve credit for having tried because a whole series of New York governors just punted, and they at least tried to come up with a plan. But that plan was built around a temporary highway. highway. Uh, they were proposing to put it next to the promenade. It hasn't gone away. They now call it a bypass rather than a temporary highway, and they've moved it closer to the park. It will tower over parts of the park if they build it. Um, you know. The idea of building a temporary highway, or bypass, or kumquat, whatever you want to call it, you know, nothing wrong with that. I mean, it makes perfect sense as an engineering matter, traffic management matter, and if you're doing it in the meadowlands of New Jersey or across the Hudson River, go, go with God. It's a perfectly fine plan. But you can't do it when there isn't space to do it between the promenade, which, is an, which has achieved iconic status, and this park which is beloved by millions. And that's the reality that they, that they refuse to address or accept. Um, how do they propose to tear down and completely rebuild the highway, wider than the current roadway, even at two lanes, and provide safe space for the people and equipment doing the work and build a temporary highway without making the central section of Brooklyn Bridge Park unusable or unreachable for a decade or more. People keep asking the question, and there is no answer from the DOT. They keep ducking. They keep saying, well, we're working on it. We're, we'll have a plan, blah, blah, blah. They also, in the public outreach session so far, they've devoted all their time so offering up three fanciful designs for connections from the promenade to the park. If you look at them, they're lovely. They'd be great. I ask, where in Connecticut do you plan to put them? 
because there is no way they fit in the available space. And if you tried, you would be building over significant parts of Brooklyn Bridge Park and destroying the promenade as we know it. Who, who on earth thinks that that is worthwhile even before you get to the billions of dollars it would take that should be spent elsewhere? Uh, again, nobody's asked them to redesign the park or the promenade. The world seems pretty happy with both as they are. What we need to do is fix the highway and to do it with minimum impact on any of these other, any of these other issues. It's really, in the end, not an engineering question. It's a question of your values. And do you, do you place interstate truck traffic and toll avoidance above protection of vital public spaces? Uh, I could go on with more examples, but I see that, that I'm running out of time. So let me, just, let me just say this in conclusion. It's not too late. We know from his public statements that Mayor Adams cares deeply about Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, let's count on that. We know that there are some smart people, talented people, both inside the DOT and outside, who are working on this project. And there is still time for them to get it right. Not a lot of time, but there's still time. There would be more time if they waterproofed the road and did stuff to keep it from collapsing in the meantime. But there's time and there's hope. But the only way that's going to happen the only way is if the people in this room and our friends and our neighbors, people who love the park, people who care about transportation policy, people who care about architecture and public space, people who care about the good of the communities, people who care about equity, people who care about the environment, people who care about all those issues, keep up the pressure and don't let them just finesse this. They need to face the facts they need to be transparent. And if the bottom line is you can't, without destroying the park and, and lots of other things, you can't totally tear down and rebuild, complete with hanging gardens of Babylon, then let's figure that out and let's get real and let's do it before we have our own version of the earthquake. Thank you very much. talking about BQE 2053 and um, our vision for the future, right? So BQE 2053, what is a decarbonized, sustainable, multimodal transportation network? So that's the subject of our next panel, um, which hopefully we will hear from our panelists on ideas for how to reduce or eliminate all freight traffic along the BQE and explore alternatives. Um, including tree-lined roadway patterns that include safe pedestrian, bicycle, and light rail networks. So as I did in the morning, I'll just introduce uh, our moderator and panelist, and then they'll um, give their presentations one by one and then join us for a panel discussion. Thank you. Tiffany Ann Taylor is our moderator. Uh, she's the Vice President of Transportation um, for Transportation at the Regional Plan Association. Prior to RPA, she served as Deputy Director of Freight Programs, Education and Research for the Freight Mobility Unit at the New York City DOT, and um, also as an Assistant Vi Vice President at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Our speakers include Denise Mendez, who is Director of Freight Mobility at New York City DOT, Walter Hook, who is the Principal and Vice President at BRT Plan, Zabi Bent, who is a consultant, and Yona Freemark, who's a senior research associate in the Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center at the Urban Institute. So Denise is our first speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, a pleasure to be here. I really want to thank uh, the IPA for extending the invitation. 
um, and uh, really want to sort of dive into some of the details. Um, I'll be focusing specifically on freight movement and a lot of the work that the city is doing uh, to modernize the freight distribution system, uh, as well as really think about how we're reimagining how freight comes into our region. Um, so I'll do some table setting and also talk through um, some of the broad uh, programs that we're working on um, and also some recent insights um, based on uh, activity on uh, the BQE. Um, so Hank really stole the show, um, talking a lot about some of his work and it was really a pleasure working with him uh, while he was at the DOT. He certainly pushed and challenged us um, quite a lot uh, to um, really think about um, options for marine freight. And uh, he coined a term, Department of Transformation. Um, and so oftentimes we do think about that um, quite a lot. Um, so hopefully by the end of this presentation, my hope is that um, you will get a better understanding of the state of freight movement in New York City, um, understand some of the complexities in, uh, in terms of the network and the logistics network that makes up New York City um, uh, freight system, uh, make a connection particularly between consumer demand and sort of transportation and how sort of the personal decisions that we often make uh, could have an impact um, in terms of the freight movement that we see today um, and also um, just broader things in terms of what, what can be done. Okay, um, so I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but the broad mission of DOT is to ensure that we have safe, efficient, uh, environmentally responsible pe movement of people and goods. And so my role is really focusing on the goods part of that. Um, DOT has broad goals in terms of making sure that we have safe, equitable, um, responsible movement of people, pedestrians, cyclists, et cetera. Um, goods is a critical part of that, ensuring that we reduce congestion, balance all of those needs, um, more broadly in thinking about the city's infrastructure. Um, we really wanna think about how we provide uh, folks with more options to get around and really that is um, sort of the heart of um, how um, we think about uh, a lot of our work. Um, so some context and uh, Hank really um, hit it on the nail. We are ex experiencing increased demand on an aging infrastructure that is already constrained. We are not going to build our way uh, sort of out of these challenges. We really need to think about how we manage our infrastructure um, in a more sustainable manner. Um, and um, but you know it's it's really important to think about. Um, the challenges uh, that we're facing today, and then also um, as we see that there's likely gonna be about a 68% increase in freight activity um, between 2012 and 2045 on an already ex uh, constrained infrastructure. And so that requires us to really think critically about what's happening today and how we shift uh, and redistribute that demand. Um, so each city uh, really relies on a uh, safe um, and efficient uh, transportation system um, to connect people to jobs, where they want to work, where they want to play, but also to get access to the goods that they need. Um, the World Economic Forum predicts that an increased demand uh, for e-commerce will result in about 26% um, delivery vehicles in inner cities by 2030. Um, and so freight movement is also very regional, right? It's not limited to a New York City um, with a growing population here. Um, we're seeing a lot of constraints uh, more broadly. And New York City is recognized as a global leader, um, particularly in this space. Um, I will advance the slides because I know we are running out on time. Um, New York City's freight and logistics network is uh, pretty constrained um, before the uh, bridges and tunnels that connected many of the, the boroughs. Um, we really relied a lot on marine freight. Um, and so some parts of history can sort of repeat itself and we're sort of returning to that. But we have limited access points coming into the city from over the Hudson. The George Washington Bridge carries about 30,000 trucks a day serving all parts of New York City, but also New England as well. Um, and uh, you know, historically there's been an underinvestment in rail and maritime, and so we are really heavily thinking about how to um, distribute that activity. 
But I'd be remiss without talking about sort of the convenience that we've all become used to. The fact that we are ordering things online and expecting it to come within an hour, two hours. And what does that mean? That means that the infrastructure to support our convenience um, and the demand that we're seeing on our streets is really a direct correlation there, right? Distribution facilities are now being placed in communities that have been disproportionately um, impacted already. And so there's additional burden that we're also seeing and hearing and we're thinking about how do we better balance and manage that, right? These facilities are being placed closer to communities so that they can get access to the workforce but also to deliver to customers and to that demand. Um, so it's really important to think about that. Um, it's notable uh, that the concerns that communities uh, like um, the parts of South Bronx as well as Red Hook, other parts of industrial business zones and areas that are experiencing a lot more activity um, in general. And so we really need to think about more holistic solutions. I'll just really quickly talk about some of the activity that we've been seeing um, since COVID uh, on the BQE. Um, and so we looked at activity before COVID and then also after COVID to see the, the comparison. And by and large, we're seeing a lot um, of increased truck trips to industrial business zones that are along the waterfront, um, as well as some parts of Manhattan and other areas, right? So it's serving a regional component as well, but it's also serving local trips. Um, and we need to think about what that system needs to look like um, you know, based on broader um, operations um, in the city. And so the city, uh, as Hank alluded to, but the city is taking an, a multi-agency effort uh, to explore viable alternative routes to bring in freight into the city, looking at ways to reduce truck traffic, particularly on the BQE, um, such as maritime and rail solutions. But the freight activity is not going away. We really need our stuff, and we still need to think about the network to get that. Um, so what are we doing? We released some strategic plans. Um, we are actively working on implementing those plans and scaling up our initiatives. It takes time, particularly because the freight industry, right, operates on infrastructure that has been maintained or, and operated and uh, in, uh, built by the public sector, but it's mostly the, the, the private sector. So really, there's that cross collaboration, there's partnerships that are needed, um, and really thinking about how do we create that change management within the industry more broadly. And so we released our broader Delivering Green, which Hank um, uh, so proudly um, touted at the end of uh, December 2021 that really encapsulates the work that we're doing uh, to ensure that we have a modern um, and strong multimodal sustainable freight supply chain. And so that plan is based on five pillars, shifting more freight to rail, shifting more freight to water, greening the last mile, um, and making it more efficient, uh, thinking about sort of different systems to better manage that activity, and fostering a culture of compliance, which is extremely important. How good are rules if they aren't followed, right? We need to make sure that there's a system of compliance, et cetera. So we're encouraging really bold action, and some of the work that we're doing, I'll just run through our toolkit. We have offer our deliveries, changing demand of when goods come into the city, that's heavily dependent on receivers and businesses actually making the decision of when they want the deliveries to come in. Um, we just recently launched a microhub report and we're gonna be launching those this summer where we're creating spaces to transflow from larger vehicles to smaller, more sustainable ones. So you'll hear more about that. We're expanding access at the curb. You had Hank talk about loading zones. Mode shift is critically important. We also make to make sure that it's actually green, right? Marine freight could also, some of the diesel vessels can actually be more polluting than trucks. And so we need to think about electrification and broader alternative fuels as we think about mode shift. Um, we're doing quite a lot on cargo bikes. We launched a pilot almost four and a half years ago, and we're really looking at scaling that up. Part of the challenges that we're facing is we need to remove some of the barriers that are in Albany for creating uh, more competitive um, size cargo bikes to be able to, to, to rival you know, other larger moats. Um, we have a very uh, successful clean truck program uh, that is ex expanding to industrial business zones citywide where we're giving rebates and incentives up to $185,000 to 
turn out your older diesel polluting truck to a cleaner one. Uh, we're also developing a larger um, truck electrification strategy that will develop shared charging hubs as well as um, publicly accessible charging stations, really creating the infrastructure that allows the industry to transition and shift. Um, and most importantly, thinking about how we manage our network and our streets, right? Thinking about connectivity and the network. And then a safe systems approach is very critical. I heard some initial thoughts about that. Thinking about the safety of the system is critical. Um, so I want to just really end on the fact, um, just some, some key points, moving freight forward um, requires um, quite a lot of education, um, of the issues and critical elements to invest in the infrastructure to create a multimodal system. Um, ensuring regional coordination and regulatory harmonization is a critical part of that. Freight movement is governed by federal, state, and local regulations. And so when we think about some of the things that we need to do here and within the city, it may require a change at the federal level to really see the impro improvement uh, here in the city. And so building consumer awareness is also critical. We want to make sure that we en enhance the importance um, of private sector partnerships. Um, and uh, again, this is a once in a lifetime generation for us to leverage infrastructure funds from the bill, the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed. We are actively thinking about that and thinking about investing in building out the marine infrastructure and the rail infrastructure as well. Um, so I want to end there, and I thank you so much for your time. I will pass it over uh, to Tiffany, um, I guess, or the, the next speaker, uh, Janet. Oh, Walter, sorry. <laughs> thank you. There we go. OK, well, again, I'd like to uh, thank the Institute for Public Architecture for having me speak. I uh, took a look at the issues surrounding particularly the triple cantilever. Uh, back when I was the CEO for the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, uh, we did a big study with the World Resources Institute about highway takedowns around the world, and we found that, uh, that uh, you know, that, that they were torn down in some cases for very specific reasons. And urban highways in particular serve very specific functions. Long distance truck travel, it's very important. Uh, to get the local truck traffic off the local streets, uh, long distance bus trips, these are critical functions. You don't want to lose them. Uh, less important is long distance car trips. And what you want to avoid is short distance car and taxi trips. So that's just like a policy framework. Um, when we looked at the really successful highway takedowns like this, Chongi Chong in Seoul, we found that they all had similar characteristics. Uh, the economic value of the highway that they tore down wasn't very high in most of these cases. Uh, the cost of reconstruction was more than the highway was worth. The land was extremely valuable that was released by the removal of the highway. The blight caused by the highway was so serious that removing it uh, increased uh, the property values enormously and, um, you know, and it provided a much better access to some kind of critical public amenity, usually a waterfront. Uh, in the case of the BQE, the economic importance of the highway is, unfortunately, extremely high. There's 17,800 trucks a day. It's about 12% of the traffic. Um, it's the primary uh, way of getting freight from Staten Island, New Jersey, Red Hook, and Industry City into Long Island and Queens partially into Manhattan, and also into North Brooklyn, into the Maspeth area. So, you know, the, um, the problem is really that cars and Uber drivers, et cetera, are congesting that critical piece of highway, and they don't really need to be there. Um, the economic development plans of the city are to keep, you know, some level of light industry in, in the waterfront area, par partially because we do want it to shift to water eventually. So we're not going to get rid of all the trucks. And because we can't get rid of all the trucks, we can't really get rid of the entire highway. However, I am convinced that we can divert a lot of the truck, tra tra truck traffic off of it. And I believe we can get rid of a lot of the car 
and Uber traffic. Um, so I believe that you know reducing it to two by two permanently is perfectly feasible. Um, so the first strategy is to get the cars and Uber drivers off. Um, you know the first problem is Hank mentioned is there's a the it, you know the people driving over the the free bridges the Brooklyn and Manhattan bridge they don't have to pay the toll uh, they obviously congestion charging could be an opportunity to harmonize the tolls and 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 drive some of that traffic through the battery tunnel uh, unfortunately that's not what's being proposed but it's there is a political opportunity to push that um, congestion charging on the BQE itself seems like a logical next step for congestion charging. I mean, it's a congestion charge. You should put it where there's the congestion. And, you know, this is one of the most congested pieces of infrastructure in, in the country. Um, some of the access ramps and, and egress ramps from the BQE are not that critical. Uh, the one at Atlantic Avenue is not particularly heavily used. It's particularly not heavily used by trucks. So we believe that the access and egress at Atlantic could be removed. That would take some of the trucks, would take uh, some of the uh, traffic off the BQE. Um, it's currently, there's no intercity bus services, that, sorry, interborough bus services. I believe that adding interborough inter bus services would, uh, also make it easier for people to leave their cars at home instead of taking Ubers, we could run. And there are plans for some uh, express bus services over the Williamsburg Bridge that would connect Queens and outer parts of Brooklyn into Manhattan. There's no reason we couldn't be running buses over the uh, longer distance buses uh, into Manhattan from Brooklyn. Um, Hank mentioned this, and I think it's is absolutely a good idea. A lot of the truck traffic that's going into Queens and Long Island could be diverted onto the Belt Parkway. Now, admittedly, it would require reconstructing parts of the Belt Parkway, but it's really not that many overpasses. And, um, you know, this is uh, Robert Moses' uh, heritage stuff. The only reason you can't drive a truck down it is because Moses kept the overpasses too low to allow buses to go down the Belt Parkway for you know, historically racist reasons about getting to the beach. So I think that, that opening the Belt up to trucks would uh, alleviate a lot of that tension. <laughs> um, again, the congestion charge, by equalizing it, giving the discount for, uh, for the battery tunnel so that the, the so that the tolls are more or less equalized, should redistribute a lot of the truck trips also through the battery tunnel. Um, I think that we should also be demapping some of the truck routes that are, the, that are killing the most people in, in New York. I know that the Metropolitan Avenue and Grand Avenue right through the middle of Williamsburg, you know, I've known people who were killed there at, at Metropolitan and, Gra and Graham, and you know, it's destroying these neighborhoods, and, the trucks are backed up for miles. I get that they need to get on the trucks, but you should be improving the Morgan Avenue and the Flushing Avenue accesses for trucks. Uh, I think that we could demap the Atlantic uh, to, uh, to the BQE section, which is currently a long distance trucking route. There's no real need for it. Um, that would allow us to redesign the lower part of Atlantic to increase public space and make that connection much nicer. Absolutely shift what we can to uh, waterfront for aid and marine, but I don't know how much that's really going to do, but it's definitely worth a shot. Certainly the, the connections across the BQE could be radically improved. I mean, obviously we shouldn't reconstruct them all, but some of them are really, really critical, and they could at least be made halfway decent. I mean, anybody who lives in Williamsburg has walked down Metropolitan Avenue to go from East Williamsburg to Williamsburg, and there's like trash everywhere and you know, water pouring down. It's just horrible. So, you know, and, and biking through that junction is just a nightmare. So obviously you should be able to do something about these critical crossings. Um, I've, I've got this idea of, of turning Grand Street in Williamsburg into a greenway and putting a bike ped bridge over the BQE to connect uh, because the Grand Street 
uh, bike lanes are really terrible, and the highway is slightly submerged there, so you could create this kind of greenway. There's a lot of crossings at the trench that could be um, improved with bike and pedestrian crossings. Um, um, Scott Stringer's office actually proposed capping the whole trench and opening that up as a park. I think that's a pretty interesting idea. Um, you know, the, what's underneath of large sections of the BQE is essentially another highway. And, you know, obviously we don't necessarily need two highways, one on top of the other. And this is particularly true in the southern and northern sections. Uh, how we use that space. I, I, I don't think we should necessarily be building, as Hank said, I don't think we should be building parks under the highway. Nobody wants to be there. But, you know, having that, you know, removing more cars from on city streets and allowing them to park under the highways or using it for other functions that are, don't need to be nice, I think is a good idea. So um, I guess I'll sort of leave it at that. But I think that. We're never going to get rid of the highway, but we can certainly divert the truck traffic. We can certainly divert some of the, some of the car and Uber traffic off, and we can at least reclaim some critical pieces of, of city fabric. Um, and I basically, I agree with Hank's points about let's just reconstruct it as a two by two. Thanks very much. Hi, folks. Um, hi. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I love that. Uh, so I'm Zabe Bent. Uh, I have no slides. I'm actually going to try to just talk to you all <laughs> for about five minutes. Um, but before we do, I've met some of you, but not everyone, and, and certainly not a lot of you. So who here is an architect? OK. Uh, a planner? Engineer? Ooh, so few of us. There's like three, three engineers in the room. Okay. Uh, activists. Everybody should be raising their hand right now because everyone wants something to be different. So there we go. Um, how many people live in the corridor? Okay. Fewer. And in Brooklyn at large. All right. That helps me. Hopefully it helps some of you. Queens. Yes. That's, I mean, yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so my name is Zabe Bent. I am a planner, an engineer, and a designer. And I work on multimodal planning and, and urban development for many, many years. Um, and because of my training, I like to think that I can talk to planners and engineers and architects in their own language and hopefully translate that for normal people. And I mean that in every sense of the word. <laughs> um, so I would say, however, that um, my training is one part of, of sort of who I am as a, a planner and an urbanist, and I really started in childhood when I would spend my school days trying to get to the park or playing in the parking lot behind my building, and I wasn't able to do it. You know, there was always something in the way, and a lot of times that was a major arterial or a highway or a highway on or off ramp in my case. Um, and throughout childhood and still now, the streets that provided access to some people really cut me off from the parks, from my school, uh, from my local bodega. <laughs> it was just constantly something that I was trying to traverse. And it really sort of galvanized me to become the person that I am today and to, to sort of drive the work that I do. Pun not intended, sorry about that one. <laughs> um, but connecting the divisions and sort of correcting those divisions was really the thing that drives me um, at this point. And most people, who's heard of NACTO? Awesome. So, some of you know me then. Um, so I was most recently at NACTO, which is an organization that hosts DOTs as members um, across the U.S. and Canada. And I worked on an update to the Urban Bikeway Guide. I worked on a resource for using streets for pandemic response and recovery. And also a massive call to reframe uh, what's sort of an engineering Bible in our, in our world, the MUTCD. Who's heard of the MUTCD? Hopefully no one. Oh my gosh, okay. Lots of nerds in the room. Love it. Um, but really trying to change the, the systems, not just individual projects, not sort of making changes on the margins, but really looking at deeper changes. And it's interesting that I'm sandwiched between Walter and, and Yona because they have very concrete ideas about what to do next. And I really want to take a step back and say, 
let's rethink what we're doing here and make sure that we understand that how we're getting to the future that we want to see. Um, and so I wanted to talk about some of the other projects that I've done. Again, I'm known as a street designer, but I've also worked on major transportation projects, traffic studies, uh, San Francisco's first congestion pricing study, um, and sort of at the tail end of the Octavia Boulevard, who's heard of that project, uh, which is a conversion from the double-deck freeway, central freeway in San Francisco, to a uh, four-lane boulevard. Worked on another toll road project, um, trying to turn that into a parkway, and it went nowhere. <laughs> Um, and part of this is it takes a long time to get these projects off the ground and a long time to really understand what are the impacts of the sort of big future vision that we want to see. Thank you. And a lot of times people don't understand what the impacts are. And I've worked on a lot of infrastructure projects in the last 20 years and so I want to first ask how many people support the idea of a trench or a cap for the BQE? What? Come on, more hands than that. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and how many people understand the impacts of a trench or a cap? How many people feel like they, aha, lot, less hands, <laughs> far fewer. How many people support taking it down altogether? How many people feel like they understand how much traffic will be on their streets? <laughs> fewer hands. <laughs> and that's kind of the point. I think one of the things we have to start with is really understanding how much demand is going to change and how much space is going to change and how much use of that space is going to change before and after a project. And as we were talking about transparency um, earlier, we often don't feel like we get the transparency that we need from city staff or from state staff. And quite honestly, a lot of times there isn't trust there, but a lot of times staff are sort of reluctant to say, this is gonna look really different because either they don't have the right tools or they're, or they're sort of worried about how people are going to react. And so I think we need to change the way that we work together and start looking at each other as potential partners in finding solutions rather than combating each other and saying the city and the state versus the community, we are all people. We all live and work in this area and we all need to work together to figure out what is the solution and how do we get there. Starts with trust and transparency. That is a very pie in the sky idea, but it's really critical. <laughs> Um, I think another component to think about is what does happen when those projects sort of transform the urban fabric. Um, we are talking about a dedicated, a single use uh, project and that infrastructure is going to change uh, the way that we move around in the city, but again, we don't really have a good understanding of, of what that looks like. And capping or trenching or any of those things is really just covering up the problem. <laughs> The cars are still there, the trucks are still there. If we don't change the different users of that street, add transit, you know, look at walking and biking and sort of understand what the changes are going to be, we won't actually see a change in our future. And so it's really critical, again, to think through how are we going to change what this infrastructure is. We can't just cover up the problem. We can't just tear it down because we can't go back. Um, we need to start from where we are today, definitely center the community vision for what that future is going to be and think through how do we get where we wanna go, understanding what we know about the current conditions. I am out of time, I have lots more to say, but we have a panel. <laughs> Thanks so much. Hey everyone, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, my name is Yona Freemark and I'm a researcher at an organization called the Urban Institute, we're a nonprofit research organization in Washington, D.C. Um, and I'm gonna be talking through some, some facts about the BQE and some potential ideas for how we can rethink it based on, based on my experience. So what do we know right now about some of the land uses in the area within uh, about 500 meters of, of the BQE, which is like a relatively close distance of, of the facility, maybe a third to a half mile. Well, I looked at all the land uses among the, the parcels that are in those areas, and I divided it up among a number of different neighborhoods, Bay Ridge, Sunset Park, South Brooklyn, Downtown Brooklyn, Greenpoint and Williamsburg, and, and the Queens section of the BQE. And one thing that I found pretty remarkable is that there's a lot of, actually a lot of underused land. And I think that there's a good reason for that, which is that being near the BQE to a large degree is not an appealing condition. People don't want to be near it. And I'll give you some examples of why that's the case.
But this raises some fundamental questions that I think fall upon what Zabe said, which is, what is the city that we want to have in the future? Do we want a city that is defined by the highways, the sound and noise, and the air pollution that comes from it? Or do we want a city that's defined by a different way of living that's more about livability? And fundamentally, we have a problem right now, which is that there are huge sections of parking and transportation land located in areas very close to this facility. Those are opportunities for change, but they're not going to change quickly unless we rethink how the facility works and what we want to see in the future. Now, one thing that is very clear is that the impacts of the BQE, the negative impacts of the BQE, are not equitably distributed. And we know that not only by looking at the city as a whole, but specifically by comparing the areas directly adjacent to the road with areas somewhat further out. And that's what I do with these graphs here. What I'm showing is that when you look at the share of the population that's white versus the share that's not white, in the areas that are within 100 meters or within 300 meters of the road, which, by the way, are the areas where you are most likely to be exposed to the cancer-causing and other illness-causing cause effects of air and noise pollution, you see that those areas are disproportionately non-white compared to the areas that are just a bit further out. So fundamentally, we have an equity reason to think about fundamentally transforming what this facility is. The facility as it exists not only segregated and divided neighborhoods in the past, it acts today as a source of inequity in our community that causes people to be exposed to ill health. We also see similar trends when it comes to income when you look at three of the communities on this chart. Now, one thing that is particularly interesting is that there is one neighborhood along the route where these trends do not show up. And that one neighborhood is actually in downtown Brooklyn along the, uh, the, the, the portion next to Brooklyn Bridge Park. And I think one reason for that is that those folks are sort of um, able to hide away from the highway. They don't actually see the highway because it's below them, and the negative consequences of the highway aren't nearly as clear on the neighborhood. And in fact, the property values uh, in the areas right adjacent to that highway in the section along the cantilever are higher than the ones further away. I think partially because you get that wonderful view of, of the riverfront. But that suggests that fundamentally the design of the highway plays a major role in impacting who lives adjacent to it, how much money they have, you know, whether these are neighborhoods that people uh, of a diversity of, of different backgrounds want to live in. Now, I looked at property values explicitly. And one thing I found was that fundamentally, across the highway, when you control for a number of different characteristics, properties that are closest to the road have significantly lower property values than those further away. So for the perspective of the city's interest, you know, the, the fact that people want to invest in this city, if we care about that as a community, the highway is causing significant lower property values in the areas right around. So I won't get into this in detail because I have a limited amount of time. But this all raises questions from my perspective about what the future of the roadway should be. And we heard some ideas from Walter and others. Um, and I'm just going to propose a hypothetical, okay? That just an idea. If you have this space currently occupied by the BQE in the areas in Brooklyn, I looked at Brooklyn exclusively. The BQE and the surrounding infrastructure, by which I mean the on-ramps and things like that, occupy about a third of a square mile, oh, sorry. Yes, occupy about a third of a square mile in Brooklyn. Now that may not sound like a huge amount, but from my perspective, this is enough to provide for freight uses, to provide for a new transit facility, provide park space, and provide housing distributed across the footprint of the BQE as it exists today. This would require radically altering our thinking about who the BQE is for, and following up on Hank, what Hank said, do we really need this highway to exist for the use of private automobiles in a city where we intentionally want to reduce car use and we want to stop emitting so much carbon. My sense is we, we can try something different. So what would it look like if we divided up the current footprint of the BQE into half transportation uses, a quarter park uses, and a quarter housing uses? Well, 50% transportation uses could be enough for some dedicated freight use and a new transit way connecting 
the neighborhoods along the, the route. I fundamentally agree with some of the things that Walter said about the need for a place for the trucks to go. We don't have a clear strategy to transition all of these trucks into marine uses and other spaces. We need to continue providing for some facilities for trucks. But we need to be advancing quickly on the electrification programs that were discussed earlier with regard to the DOT. These do not have to be the sources of extreme levels of ill health that we currently see along a highway. And so we need to be thinking about ways to move quickly towards electrification of the trucking. One thing that I like to think of is the existence of the Hudson Tunnels for the National, national Inner City Rail Network, okay? We have this National Inner City Rail Network that is reliant on coming into Penn Station, right? And that requires going through this tunnel where you're not allowed to have diesel trains. Because of this one tunnel and the existence of Penn Station, we essentially require all uh, national train services that go into New York to, have, to either be fully electrified or to be able to operate using electrification for part of their time. Why don't we have, why don't we have some exciting ideas about how to do that for truck freight as well? Why don't we revolutionize the way that we are powering our trucks through New York City? I also think we have an opportunity to do this in a way that increases transit connections. The BQE serves a lot of areas that are not well served by our subway today. You could reduce the transit times from Red Hook to Northern Greenpoint from one hour to 20 minutes if we had a transit line that was along that route. There's also plenty of room for green space. If you devoted 25% of that, a third of a square mile to green space, that would be the equivalent of roughly two Fort Green parks or seven High Lines. So you could add tremendously to neighborhoods that are extremely lacking in green space. And finally, let's say you reserved the last quarter of that right of way for housing. If you developed it at the density of Carroll Gardens today, you could get about 4,500 housing units that are desperately needed in our communities. If you did it at the density of Brooklyn Heights, you could get 12,000 housing units. That's a huge number of housing units and a huge opportunity to create more vibrant neighborhoods around open space and transit. So that's why I'll leave you here today. Thank you so much. Hello, ah, yes, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, I'll try it again. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I know it's late in the day and it's a little warm and it's rainy, um, but I really appreciate you all sticking around. Um, I'd actually like to start with a round of applause again for our wonderful presenters today. Um, I know I learned a lot. Um, you, you heard a little bit of my resume earlier. Um, before, I am a former city employee, currently at RPA now, and I still learned a lot, so thank you very much. Um, and I'd also like to thank IPA for inviting me to participate as well, and I actually really appreciate um, the intentionality in making sure that there's been lots of representation um, just as in terms of demographics of, of speakers, um, their level of expertise, their areas of expertise, so I really appreciate the intentionality and diversity of that. So I want to be really mindful of time, um, and I'll be uh, reading my notes here. I promise I'm not texting anybody. Um, but I'm going to change the order up a little bit on the questions. So I'm actually going to ask um, probably about three questions to all of you, a call of you ahead of time, um, and then we'll save some time to make sure that the audience can ask questions. And if there's any space afterwards, I have more questions to ask. So this is for everyone. I'm going to start with Denise. Uh, so. The BQE has disconnected the fabric of many neighborhoods along the corridor. Recent design proposals call for the network of fragmented parks and community spaces to be rejoined. Now, imagine it is 2053. We have shifted as much freight as possible to other modes while greatly reducing car traffic on the BQE as well. Where do you see the biggest opportunities for neighborhood reconnection? Um, and what do you think were the biggest steps taken to get us there? Wow. Um, way to lead in with, with, with that question. Um, 
I think to think about our future vision, we really need to, and it's sort of I talked about um, how we're reimagining or creating a new sets of systems um, for a freight movement. Um, some of the things that we're thinking about um, is sort of elements of like consolidation and like how do you integrate um, elements of goods goods movement and services um, within sort of the urban fabric. Um, Freight, and we've talked about this often, freight has often been designed to be invisible, but oftentimes, you know, I think we saw during COVID uh, when we couldn't get our stuff or couldn't get toilet papers, any of those things, it just became a problem. And so that spotlight um, really shed a lot of light. So for us, I would say just really thinking about um, maybe hub and spoke systems and nodes. Uh, we, uh, y Yona, is it? Uh, talked about underutilized spaces. Maybe those spaces could be activated for transloading spaces or neighborhood hubs that could break down freight into more sustainable modes like cargo bikes that can go to the last mile or to someone's home. Really, you're still getting your packages, but it's in a more sustainable manner, and we can sort of activate spaces that are either underutilized um, for those central hubs, and that can also reduce truck VMT into certain neighborhoods, right? Um, thinking about those systems, I think, would be really helpful. Um, and I think broadly, the network of streets, um, taking a, a safe um, sort of design um, concept so that we can still accommodate freight, I think is also gonna be critical. I can't tell you, I don't know what it's gonna look like in 30 years, you know, 30 odd years from now, and that's um, part of the challenge, but we do need to start thinking big uh, and have a bold vision for that. Great, thank you. Zawa, you wanna take it next? Um, I echo a lot of what you've just said, so I'm not gonna repeat, but I, I do also think um, I would hope that there's a shift in the way that we manage just-in-time delivery because that is a huge driver of freight as well. And so really understanding how can we either price or policy or something to shift the way that we think about you know, going on Amazon and you know, buying six things that are delivered in six different packages at six different moments in time, which is six different trips, right? So figuring out how, how does that work um, and what can we do to shift the demand side as much as the, the delivery side of things and the, the supply side. Um, I also do think smaller vehicles, not just on freight, um, sort of private deliveries, but uh, any other type of vehicle use is critical for um, managing our street network as well. Um, and we're starting to see some trends in other countries, not so much in the US. Um, and again, more cargo bikes, or cargo bikes available for individual use as well as for commercial use. Um, those are other opportunities that I, I can imagine. In terms of specific places where we see new connections, I think mapping many of the locations that you know Walter and Yona have talked about um, and understanding where are those opportunities, where are they small, where are they large, where might we be able to amass some of those and sort of connect them. Um, I think that is another concern that we really need to, to look at and figure out what are the ways the community would like to use those spaces because not everything should just be an open space park. Uh, there might be other ways to use the public space. Um, it could be food. I think someone was talking about um, food production or food distribution, um, but it could be uh, community clinics. There's so many other things that need public space um, dedicated for their use. Great, thank you. Walter, you wanna take the next? Sure. Um, obviously, we, I live in Brooklyn, so I live in Carroll Gardens, so, and I used to live in Williamsburg, so of course I obsess over my own neighborhoods. And um, certainly in, in when I was living in Williamsburg, you know, I was having to cross the BQE to go from where I lived in East Williamsburg to the waterfront or to anywhere in the core of Williamsburg. And, you know, as, as a cyclist, it's just really unsafe. Like, all the crossings are terrible. You know, the speed of the, of the turning movements on, uh, on Meeker and Union, all of them, they're all like at very high speed angles. And not much has really been done. The environment under the BQE is, you know, horrendous, particularly at night, you know, going through there. You got your kids or whatever, ah, you know, no light or nothing. And, I, you know, and I've been in Europe where the underpasses of railways or, or roads are, you know, beautified by colorful lighting and plants and whatnot, you know. So obviously something could be done. Obviously, Red Hook is really cut off by the BQE. And, you know, the, it's almost impossible to cross into Red Hook, which is now 
got a stunning waterfront in multiple locations, so can, reconnecting under Red Hook. Uh, Industry City is, is this massive growth point, and to get there from the R train, you know, you're walking under this stuff, and it's really horrible. And, and you know, I think that the city's led with, on the 14th Street uh, busway, it's also open to trucks. And I think that kind of truck and bus combination, ha we can use that a lot more places in the city. You know, HOV plus truck on, on a lot of the bridges and tunnels, uh, that, that's a, a tool in the toolkit that I think has a lot of potential. You know, I would say I'm the only New York non-New Yorker here, so I don't want to uh, overstate my uh, welcome by saying that one neighborhood is more important than another. But, you know, I think one thing that I'm hearing from this conversation is that we need to be thinking at different scales on addressing this issue. We have fundamentally a, na actually it's a national problem when it comes to decarbonization of our transportation system and specifically the freight transport system. We have to address that nationally. Unless we start doing that, we're going to have I mean, we, we already have problems related to highways everywhere. This is just one example of that. Then we have the local level, thinking about the BQE, but then we have the street level, where we were talking during lunch. Fundamentally, we have all these competing demands for our street. We have people who want to park. We have, uh, you know, the, the shared bikes. We have uh, garbage containers. And now we have deliveries happening all the time. We need to do a much better job in thinking through how to organize those uses so that we can shift successfully into more cargo bikes, small scale truck deliveries, and things of that sort. And we need to be doing all these things at these different scales simultaneously. So it's, it's a lot of work for planners to be thinking about right now. Great, thank you all. Um, so I don't know about you audience, but what I heard was we actually have a lot of these tools available to us today, right? I think that's what I heard, okay, just checking. Great, okay. No, I'm a funny host, you can laugh, it's fine. Um, okay, so next question, this is for everyone. I'm gonna switch it up a bit so that everyone can answer. Um, and Yona, I'm actually gonna start with you. Um, so given your respective areas of expertise and what you know about the challenges put forth by the BQE, what would you say are the biggest obstacles in making substantial changes towards a more decarbonized and sustainable transportation future? or I will put forth what are some important stakeholders you need to be able to answer that question. Well, I, you know, I mean, just talking through the conversation today and thinking about the reconstruction problems we have, learning from Hank about the realities of what it would take to actually rebuild the cantilever leaves us in this sort of impossible bind, right? In my view, the idea of building a giant temporary expressway over Brooklyn Bridge Park or something like that is insane and, and not feasible either. I, I don't see that happening. So the question is, are we going to, okay, great, I'm glad we all agree. But I, so the question is, is the highway just going to close? And then what? What are we going to do during that period? If it's closed, is it going to be closed temporarily? Are we going to just accept the trucks on our streets? Or are we going to say tomorrow, we need a plan to get all the stakeholders in the room, including the freight transport companies, the, all the organizations that depend on freight, meaning the stores and also the manufacturing facilities, et cetera, in the room to agree on a strategy. Because right now, I don't think there's a strategy. And that, to me, seems very scary. If I were New York, I'd be scared. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, within the last three months, very close friends of friends uh, were killed by trucks on bicycles. So the cycling community now with the huge increase of trucking and the huge increase in bicycling are really on a collision course that's, that's really devastating families, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, so I've been forced to actually think about freight because there's so much freight out there. And the obviously, but I'm also sympathetic that we need the trucks, you know, because they're delivering stuff and everything. So obviously a dialogue with the trucking associations and, and the, the, the trucking groups is, is, is more important. We, we don't talk to them, honestly. And there's got to be some give and take. If we're going to take something from trucks, like demapping certain routes where we have an intensive cycling facility, maybe we can make some improvements on truck-only access ramps onto the BQE where, all right, we're going to kick them off a of metropolitan but we're going to make Morgan a much smoother entrance and fix the traffic signals or something. You know, so I think that dialogue has to happen, um, absolutely. Obviously, uh, those are the critical ones that came up for me. Yeah, 
Yeah, um, I first want to say condolences to the family members uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, tragically lost their lives. Um, it certainly is something that sort of weighs heavy on us, particularly when you're in this space, you're trying to make a lot of improvements in terms of safety and all these other things. Um, and the task is striking joy. <laughs> Right, it's it's enormous, and um, part of that is also thinking about technologies advocating for better safety ratings for vehicles, and that goes all the way up to the federal level. Right, we need to see a uh, whole system changes in terms of freight, the vehicle design. Right, we're doing quite a lot of work in DOT and, and at the city level to redesign our streets, make it safer for all road users. Um, well, we still need to think about other elements to improve safety, right? So either vehicle technology, uh, uh, blind spot awareness, and, and sort of that type of technology can be really helpful in reducing fatalities and, and, and those elements. Um, but I do, um, I do think that um, it is important to think about trade-offs, right? Um, particularly as um, when we designate, you know, truck routes on a particular corridor or street, we're looking for wider roadways. We're looking for roadways that can accommodate certain, you know, maneuvers and things like that. Those are often the spaces that we use to redesign to accommodate bike lanes and other things, uh, just because there is the space. Um, and so we have to think about the trade-offs. We have to think about how to balance, and to your point, um, all of the demand that, that we are seeing. And it requires levels of action at the local level all the way up. So, you know, it really is, um, there's no one size fits all strategy. Like we have to do all of these things together to move that forward. Um, I think there's too much disconnection between the policy levers and the scenarios that are being run, quite honestly. I think if we know that some scenario only works with congestion pricing, then we have to make sure that people understand you need to advocate for congestion pricing sooner, faster, now, <laughs> right? Like these things are connected. If we know that, you know, people would toler better tolerate truck routes in their neighborhood if the trucks were quieter then we need to advocate for vehicle changes. The policies and the strategies seem to be very disconnected and then people don't know how to advocate for them. And they also don't know the impacts of the scenarios themselves. How much additional traffic in the neighborhood? What can we do to mitigate the impact of that traffic? If not the traffic itself, what does it look like? And right now we're having separate conversations about those things rather than uniting them all. Excellent, thank you. So we have 60 seconds, I'm gonna go. Okay, lightning round question, short answers only. What do you want the audience to take away from the panel, Zabe? Uh, think bigger, think newer, think innovative. Don't just do the traditional thing and work together. Um, I would say there's value in partnerships and the industry has to be a part of the conversation. Oftentimes they are not part of the conversation and we're actively thinking about that. So I, it was more than one word, but sorry. <laughs> I, I think uh, congestion charging on the BQE, uh, harmonizing the, the tolls across the East River, and uh, opening up the Belt Parkway to trucks, that's, that's kind of an out-of-the-box idea that I think has got some legs. Uh, you know, I would pull on all those things, and I would say one thing that I heard it, that I think is really valuable is we can't just cover up the problem and pretend like it's not going to be there anymore. The, you can't just put a cap on the highway and then pretend like the problem has been solved. It hasn't been solved. So I hope we can think bigger than just a cap. Not Amen. that caps aren't great. We need to do more. Amen. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay, so we have time for audience questions. Um, so, yes, on this side. Great. Uh, hi, guys. Um, so we mentioned kind of like uh, some the toolkits that are available now. Um, and I kind of want to combine that with uh, this question is going to be directed towards Denise, I think, about um, fostering that culture of compliance. And I my question is basically like, what are the actual concrete steps to get there? Because um, I think it's very low hanging fruit to have enforcement, and to be quite honest, uh, the NYPD is completely dropping the ball. Everyone knows this. On top of siphoning billions of dollars out of the city budget, they're not doing their jobs, and I think there's some really good uh, proposals out there to get that enforcement 
into the, the uh, DOT's hand. Um, and uh, on top of that, I think it also comes from design. Like these loading zones are not good. They're not good enough. We need paint on the loading zones. There needs to be bollards. There needs to be, frankly, bigger signs to let people know this is not parking. This is, this is a loading zone. Do not come in here. Um, so I'm wondering uh, if you could talk about like the actual city's plans to foster that compliance. Yeah, that, that's a great question. It's something that we've grappled with for, for quite some time and um, understanding that sort of you can't really be everywhere at every time to cover all parts of the city. And so that requires a technology solution. And so we are actively thinking about what types of sensors could be installed to measure off-route truck activities, to measure, you know, oversized trucks and, like, where they're going. And so, um, but I think the most critical part um, and some of the challenges that we face is that in order to give sort of a, a ticket to, um, you know, a truck operator or whatever, like, you need to be able to sort of pull them over, right? And so, uh, as, you know, we, we heard at the beginning, you know, the BQE um, pilot um, that we're looking and we're very ambitiously tr trying to like get off the ground is we actually went to Albany to get approval for that, right? We've uh, been successful, I think, in New York City to expand authorization to be able to enforce some of our rules with automated enforcement and technology, right? So speed cameras has been widely um, instrumental in helping to reduce speeds on corridors that have been really dangerous, but also change behaviors, right? And so we see the opportunity to actually expand our authority, but requires going out after Albany and getting the support either from elected officials and also from constituents, just like yourself, right? We need that advocacy to be able to support those policy changes to, to enable us to be able to do that more effectively. And so that's part of our vision as well. Great, other question? Oh, I see one in the back, yes. Hi, um, thank you all so much. Um, so I have a question mostly for DOT folks. Um, how are you thinking about bollarding specifically? Because I think there's, you know, when you do human enforcement, it requires humans to get behind the idea of enforcement. Um, and bollards actually, especially electric bollards that allow for you know, a physical barrier for cars and trucks for things like open streets that we're now doing all the time everywhere. Um, how is the city thinking about a comprehensive bollarding program for open streets and, and traffic management? Thank you. Yeah, so it's it's a great question. Unfortunately, I'm not the, the one that has ex expertise in that area. Um, I know that um, in general, um, building bollards and retractable bollards requires significant sort of infrastructure underground to be able to build that. You, it's really an element of sort of maintenance and other elements as well as you think about sort of putting that infrastructure in. Um, but I am, don't have the depth of expertise in that space, so I'll just leave it at that. But it is a good question, and certainly happy to sort of take that back to, to the relevant folks in our, in, our, in our group. And I know I saw another question in the back. Yes. I was. Um, I'm a native New Yorker who grew up in East New York and Woodhaven, the Woodhaven Boulevard corridor. So I want to take it outside the scope in that I've grown up in a city where it was a one-car family. If you go outside to those sections of Brooklyn, all that traffic that's coming to the BQE are now two to three household cars. That's a problem that has to be addressed because they're not giving up their cars. And unless something changes that, that traffic is still gonna flow to the other side of Brooklyn. Um, I, I can't see whoever <laughs> made that comment because of this, this poll, which is fine. Um, but it's nice to connect as people, that's all. But I, I will say that there are ways to address that. Um, I'm gonna say congestion pricing again, I know, I'm sorry. But there are policy levers that can be applied, um, providing options for people, you know, looking at how do people get in by transit? What does that look like? How much does it cost for a family to get in by transit? And what is the cost of driving compared to the cost of transit? For an, a family of four, it, you know, you've already paid for your car. It's, if, unless we have some other lever, it's gonna be easier for them to drive than it is for them to take transit because transit costs 
get expensive when you have four people to pay for. So what are the ways that we can change that? A lot of them are price levers, but also the reliability and frequency of transit, the reliability and frequency of other modes, like you know, having bike lanes, bike lanes that can actually go across borough lines, across county lines. Oh my gosh, what a wonderful idea that nobody's thought of before. Uh, but these are all ways to change that paradigm. And until people have better options, it's going to be what it is. We have to actually invest in change. Yeah, I'll say really um, quickly that DOT is significantly investing in adding bus priority um, across New York City, um, and there um, we're also actively in, um, invested in expanding protected bike infrastructure. That's also critically important. We think about some of the challenges in terms of the sort of barriers to even using the infrastructure. Do you feel safe using it, right? So we're thinking about a lot of those elements. Um, we've also introduced things like car share that allows people to sort of share that shared mobility concept so that you're not using multiple vehicles as well. So, yep, sorry. Oh, sorry. Really quick follow-up. Um, <laughs> When I say that we have to invest in change, that includes everyone in this room coming out to the public meeting when people say that they hate that project. If you know that it's actually going to be a good change, you have to be there too. It's really convenient and easy to not show up when there's a project being proposed, but the opponents come out. <laughs> the proponents have to come out too, and that's on all of us to make sure that we're there. I just want to say real quick that the only real services serving those neighborhoods that you're talking about that are past the sort of footprint of the subway are the express buses. And I know the local advocates don't like them because they're expensive per passenger and stuff. But the truth is that's a really critical constituency. And, and we should think about expanding the uh, express bus network to those areas. And also, how can we speed up the trips with HOV bus truck lanes onto critical bridges and tunnels? You know, and I think one thing we need to keep in mind is that the MTA's peak level of bus service in terms of the number of miles it was providing per year was way back in 2005, which should raise a lot of questions because the city has gained a lot of people since then. And so we need to be taking seriously the idea that we need to be providing more transit overall, especially on the buses. I agree with that. But I would add that there are a lot of areas in the further parts of Queens that could be better served by commuter rail service that right now are not being well served either because the fares are too pricey because of the way the Long Island Railroad charges people or because the trains aren't frequent enough. And I think that investing in both those changes can really improve people's ability to not rely on two cars at the same time in their family. Thank you. I think that's all for today. So really appreciate everyone's participation. Another round of applause for our panelists.